<laughs> and it's been a harrowing three weeks. And, and, and on top of that, mm. the weekend uh, discoveries of those horrific, horrific bodies yeah. inside the quarry in M Mukuru. Goodness, what, what, what are the theories? So there are lots of theories. I mean, the community is uh, particularly um, concerned about the involvement of police. Um, the, so the, the theories around um, how those bodies came to be there and why they were not discovered so close to the Quarry Police Station um, are abound. I mean, there may be four or five theories along those. The other one that uh, many people have been worried about, of course, is the, um, uh, the bodies that may have come from the killings around the Mandamano, that these are essentially were dumped uh, pro protesters. And I think the third one that the police have been actively following is this issue around uh, potentially this could be a serial killer uh, that has been targeting women over a period of time. I think all of these theories will probably come to a uh, head this morning at about 11 o'clock when the um, uh, post-mortem into the cause of death uh, happens for the, uh, the bodies that have been retrieved. I think that's when we will know what the pattern is. And you guys are there? We're there, yes. The Independent Medical Legal Unit, Amnesty International, will have independent pathologists. We will follow the entire post-mortem for all the bodies that have been found so far. And we will not. The, our pathologists will not sign the documents, um, uh, the reports, until we, are just, until we are very clear that this is what's happened. Goodness, I mean, this is shocking, isn't it? It is horrible. I mean, what we do know is whatever the case, it is a mass crime. I mean, it's not a individual uh, crime. It is a, a crime of pr proportion. And I think for many people in the country, until we get to the bottom of this, we will really not have a sense of uh, ease and, and comfort. And this comes on the heels of what's happened during the Mandamanos with abductions and killings of young people, yeah. Gen Zs. Yeah. I mean, what's going on, Irungu? Yeah. No, things went terribly wrong with these um, uh, protests. Like, uh, I have to say, there's not like what happened last year. I mean, we lost about 60 people mm -hmm. to what was violent, unnecessary, unnecessary violence from the police. I mean, we saw the disruption of um, the process of notification, um, the arrest of uh, marshals, uh, disruption of the protest. And then, of course, unfortunately, without proper management, uh, all protests uh, tend to uh, lead into confrontation and uh, when the police get more violent the you know the protesters get more violent then you have people who came there without an, a policy agenda they've come essentially to steal or to rob or to harm others and then everything just breaks loose and the last three weeks have been very violent I mean, the kenya national commission for human rights has yet to update its uh, numbers uh, for the from this weekend but on friday it was 43 deaths that we've seen and the government insists it's a lot less yeah, I, I'm not sure who's doing the accounting for them, but they just need to reach out to the Kenya National Commission for Human Rights, who are verifying all the deaths. We, as Amnesty International, we've been involved in the verification exercise, so there is a close working relationship between civil society organisations and the Kenya National. But um, you know, there hasn't been the same level of collaboration with um, different arms of the police to ensure that the president, when he speaks, he's speaking from numbers that have been verified. Mm. We saw you at uh, some of the marches. Yeah. What was the mood like on the on the streets on the ground? So Amnesty International has uh, a protest observation uh, pro project. We run this across the world. We've been doing it for at least five years now in different places like Peru, Argentina, and, and other places. And uh, we essentially introduce pr uh, protest observers to make sure that the conduct of the police and the conduct of the protesters are consistent with Article 37. And that is to make sure that nobody carries weapons, nobody um, uh, taunts or um, uh, throws stones. Um, and secondly, you know, that the police use appropriate appropriate um, and proportional use of force when they're dealing with protesters. What we've been particularly saddened by is the lack of de-escalation. I mean, just the where there has been no attempt to speak with the protesters, to uh, jointly agree on uh, how the protest will be facilitated. Um, it's just inevitable. It's a recipe for disaster. And now tomorrow, Tuesday, yep. is yet another one. Yep. Nationwide. Are you guys worried? Are you concerned? Are you... What are you, what's going through your minds? Well, I think the uh, the the the, uh, dis, uh, the resignation of the uh, Inspector General um, uh, last week and also the change in the command gives us an opportunity for the National Police Service to demonstrate that it will manage the protest differently, that it will facilitate it, and. Um, 
We know that the military deployment is still in force and therefore the vital installations will still be um, cordoned off and not be available for protesters to protest at them. So in the National Assembly, the State House and various other um, spaces, the judiciary. Uh, but I think what's really important on a day like today would be to have the protest organizers and the National Police Service meet and discuss how they're going to facilitate peaceful protest tomorrow. Yeah, that's going to be tough if it's nationwide I mean, because, you know... It's well, it's, it's not that tough because if you think about the every um, every part of this country has a police station. Mm. Every police station has a commander in chief, mm. uh, or the co command of the station, and therefore wherever the protests are taking place, um, protesters and the organizers must reach out to the um, uh, police station and vice versa. And essentially, they can agree at the very local levels which streets um, for how long um, and how they will be facilitated. It's mm. possible the the network the Police, the national police have a national network. They could make this happen if they wish. Right. The other thing that's a cause of concern uh, across the country is abductions. Yeah. Young people being abducted, being held for days on end. Yeah. And, you know, okay, even if they're released, I mean, it, it just, uh, you know, it, 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 it uh, affects them spiritually, mentally, you name it. Yeah, I and mean, you have examples. Yeah, I mean, Jeff, you and I are probably old enough to remember the 1980s. And um, I don't know about Patrick, he looks a little Gen Z <laughs> <coughs> to me. But, um, you know, he maybe, he maybe read it in a book once. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. But, you know, I'm teasing Patrick. Yeah. But, you know, one of the things I think we have to say is that abductions have no place in our society. I mean, this is just not how you deal with issues around, um, you know, even complex tensions between um, within society or between the state and, and citizens. Um, abductions are not arrests. They do not follow any anything that is in our um, uh, statute books. I mean, you do not have a situation where the police show up at, at your house and say, uh, my name is Officer X. Uh, this is my service number. This is the uh, charges that we're preferring against you. We'd like you to come down to the station and answer a few questions. That's, that's how, you know, arrests are done. Um, and um, what we've seen in many cases is, and we heard during the Citizens' Assembly last week, um, you know, the cases of Billy Simani, Simani yeah. uh, the blogger who was, who was picked up. And he said, you know, he was picked up by people who were uh, camouflaged. They were wearing balaclavas. They had military-grade weapons. Um, they did not introduce themselves, didn't say where they were going. He was not given any opportunity to reach out to a, a family member or a, a lawyer. Um, and he found himself in a, essentially, a toilet um, for several hours um, after you know, rounds of interrogation. And if it had not been for the public pressure, um, who knows how long he would have been there. Betty Waiderero came out of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, she had disappeared for, for several days and she finally came out yesterday and um, one of the things that we have to demand is that that form of policing has no place it has it, it has to be condemned the officers that are involved in those exercises need to be arrested and to be prosecuted for essentially uh, flouting our laws and some of them haven't been as lucky you know I'm talking about the likes of Denzel and them right yeah. haven't been as lucky so last, last week, um, several of us uh, were at the post-mortem into Denzel Mondi's death. And this is a 21-year-old. He was in parliament, and there's evidence of him um, in parliament on the 25th. He went back to the university uh, that he came from, uh, Juja, and on the 27th, he disappeared. And he was not found until the 6th of July. Um, and he was face down in a quarry, um, a disused uh, quarry. Um, and I think we have to say a number of things. In his case, the postmortem declared um, that he had died as a result of um, uh, death by drowning. And we had independent pathologists there, so we can confirm that's the case. But of course, you know, he had a bruise to the back of his head. And although he may have been alive when he fell into, when he was, when he went into that quarry, the question was, was he pushed? And there's, it's, it's very strange that he would have gone, you know, m several tens of kilometers um, uh, to this quarry that none of his students, uh, none of his student colleagues even, you know, had it remotely as a place that they would go. So I think it has to be treated as a mysterious death. And um, unfortunately, the, the family will be burying him fairly soon. You, you guys must have a lot of sleepless nights, Rungu, with these, you know, what people call extrajudicial killings. Yeah, yeah. And enforced disappearances. I mean, that's the other sad thing. And, and even sadder than that, the mm. president mm. himself had said, I think it was in an inauguration mm. speech or soon after, that there'll be no more extrajudicial killings. Mm. And look what's happening. Yeah, no, it, it is tragic. I mean, I think um, you can't imagine the um, psychological impact of being abducted and uh, disappeared. You know, disappeared. You don't know whether you will die the next minute, um, how you will die, whether anybody will find your body, uh, what you know, all the family members that you've left behind. What 
will they take of this? And I think the psychological damage is not just to the individual, it's really to the, the family of those people and, of course, to the nation. I mean, I think one of the things that we have to acknowledge is that we are a nation in trauma. I mean, you can't remain... Um, unaffected by the images that we saw in Quarry recently or the um, photographs of all these young people have disappeared or the ones that have shown up dead and feel that something is still normal. So I think we have to take this um, with the seriousness that it take, that it, it needs. One of the things, one of the opportunities the president has is he, he's about to um, receive uh, names um, of the next inspector general. And uh, we were at the um, uh, Amnesty International and several organizations were at the vetting of uh, Jafeth Komi. Mm -hmm. And we uh, released a um, recommendation to the National Assembly. And we said that the, there was no confidence, given his track record, that he would be able to manage the police service in a complex moment. And we, we predicted that the economic distress would produce tension. So you need somebody who is essentially historically um, trained in human rights-based policing, understands community uh, police relationships, um, knows how to de-escalate situations, is a good communicator, he's quick. Um, and, uh, you know, the, much of the tension that we have in our country is really speculation. Um, mm -hmm. What may have happened? What, you know, how did this happen? And so yeah. on. And I think what you need is you need a, a civil center, a police officer who is able um, to uh, respond quickly to the anxiety of a nation. And I think, you know, the question has come for me is whether we actually do need a police officer to run the National Police Service. You know, perhaps we need a civilian, um, somebody who understands good management process, is able to break through the history of violent um, policing and that culture, um, and somebody who will hold police officers individually accountable and their commanding officers. Do they have your name on the list? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have a job already. <laughs> oh, do, we have, do we have such people? Do we have yeah. candidates who can fit yeah. that no, particular I, I, position? Yeah, I, I really feel like, you know, we, we underestimate Kenyans. I mean, we underestimated um, Gen Z until mm. a few weeks ago, and then suddenly they broke down the budget for us, and they broke down the taxation bill. No. They got interested in the appropriations bill. Then they got interested in the, ta the land amendment bill. Um, you know, I have a feeling that there is, you know, maybe... Two million candidates out there that we could be Whoa. looking at. Whoa. I mean, surely you know, out of fifty-six million, yeah. seventy-five percent are Gen Z. Two million of those could do this job. Uh, Irungu, when when the protests began, they were quite peaceful, and we rarely heard of any uh, violent activities and stuff like that. Where, according to you, where did we start losing it? So what happened yeah. that we started having now police using force and uh, also people being injured. You're, and, uh, you're others asking, and, where are the goons? Yeah. Where are the goons come? <laughs> That's what you're asking. Right? <laughs> Something of that sort. Yeah. No, you're, you're right, goons. I mean, you know, the... the <laughs> Like, I've never seen so many constitutions, flowers, roses, um, flags in uh, protests in many years. I mean, I think the last time, I think, probably is, is in a stadium somewhere. You know, Kenyan was running, not for their life, like they've been running <laughs> on the streets, but, you know, like was running in, a, in, yeah. a, in, a, in, a, in a, some kind of a marathon, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think what we have to um, recognize is that actually the protesters came with good intention. They came out of a concern for their country. Um, our constitution allows for people to be concerned concerned about their country. In fact, it actually requires you to be concerned about your country. So on issues of corruption, on issues of bloated, um, you know, governance, um, disregard for what's important to us rather than uh, external foreign creditors. These are all the things that the protesters came to the streets with. And um, you've seen remarkably what they've been able to do in just three, three, four weeks. We've seen, you know, decisions being taken by the president that didn't require six months of dialogues. They just required decisive action. You know, the presidency has a lot of power. Right. It is, it is an executive position. Um, and he's taken, you know, some very bold steps, I mean, including dismissing his entire cabinet. Um, and that gives an opportunity now for us to look at again, what was the purpose of Kenya Kwanzaa winning the elections? Like what was their mandate? What is the thing that inspired, um, you know, people to vote for them? And I think that's the that's this moment. But as always with nations in crisis, there are really only three paths. Right? So there's either the path of constitutionalism, where you actually you, 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 you develop and you work through the rule of law, or there is the path of um, authoritarianism, so that you actually now begin to just squash and crush any opposition, any dissent. And then the third one is anarchy. Right? Uh, there's only three paths. What, what are we seeing now? 
At the moment, I think we are <coughs> we remain constitutional, uh, but there are, of course, with the way that the uh, protesters have been managed, you've seen um, signs of authoritarianism. Mm. So I think you know it, it's not necessarily one clear model of the three. You can have one that is beginning to drift, and I think what both uh, citizens and the state need to do is make sure that we keep in the constitutional realm. Yeah, bringing the military onto the streets was also not a very good idea. Well. Uh, our judiciary uh, basically cleared it. So uh, as Amnesty, we had to then begin to look at what is it that um, uh, we expect of the military. And one of the things we said was that, you know, regardless of the military on the streets, uh, we still have a constitution. Uh, we are not a country in crisis. It's not a failed state. The president is still responsible. Um, and therefore, um, we're still in a constitutional space. And the military must not do anything that violates the Bill of Rights, that mm -hmm. violates the right to life, that violates the right of expression. And uh, essentially, we've had very few complaints, I think, from the military in terms of the actions that um, they've taken to largely, I think, to surround vital installations. Mm -hmm. And we also had uh, the talk agenda. Yeah. You were supposed to be brought on the table and so that you can discuss the way forward. Uh, has the executive reached out to your organization for the same? Yeah, to be honest, actually, uh, we received phone calls from Friday. And of course, some of the phone calls were coming when I was in Quarry, So I was a little bit uh, distracted. But, you know, the... Um, <coughs> What we were hearing was, that's the tear gas. I have to just declare that. <laughs> Whoever that police officer who tear gassed me as I was trying to remove bodies from yeah. the, the quarry, yes. um, I hope you are not having a good day somewhere. Um, I'm still you know, grappling with this thing. I, think, yeah. uh, I won't give another comment about age, but you know, <laughs> Jeff, Jeff has been tear gassed many times. He knows what I'm talking about. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. No, no, I, I mean, I think we, you know, I, I, got, I received so many phone calls from different media outlets saying, uh, have we been, has Amnesty been invited to the talks? And the answer was no. We've seen neither an invitation nor a terms of reference or a mandate or a, a document that would explain what's the, um, I guess, the parameters for the conversation. And for that reason, you know, although it, it began to feel like we were missing something, um, I checked out with a number of the human rights organizations and governors. They have not received anything either. So my sense is that whoever is having these talks will may have these talks. But I suspect that at least on the issues of governance and human rights, there is no talks. Were yeah, you there at the quarry yesterday? Mm -hmm. I've been there. When yeah, Baba I, swung by? No, no. Yesterday I took a miss. Um, but I was there Saturday and uh, Friday. But I watched uh, uh, the crowds. And the crowds are huge. Uh -huh. yeah. And what's the mood like on the ground? No, there, there's shock. There's anger. There's. Um, I mean, I've, I can tell you one of the most intense moments of my life was really in the uh, on that football pitch trying to get these body bags. Um, and there are essentially five body bags that had been retrieved on Saturday. And we were trying to get them to the um, uh, to the police vehicle with the, the director of criminal investigations, and the crowd would not have it. They wanted to open up the bags to personally inspect um, what was inside the bags. And to be honest, they um, they routed everybody. I mean, the police left, the uh, media left, the civil society organizations left, and I suddenly found myself with a group of six very brave youth standing there negotiating with hundreds of hundreds of people um, who just wanted to open the bags. And in the end, we had to agree that the, the bags be open. But then each person wanted to open up every single bag. Right. Mm. And, and see for themselves. And mm. of course, the, the issue that was paramount in all our minds was that once you destroy the evidence, yeah. once you tamper with the, um, uh, the, the body remains, then you actually don't have enough clarity for a postmortem to establish what's the cause of death and, you know, what may have happened. So I think we have to recognize that at this time, people are extremely angry and uh, disappointed uh, with everything. I mean, uh, uh, you know, that moment, I think everybody's dealing with their different levels of trauma. So this this will take some time. I mean, this will, I think, for the nation to come back to a sense of yeah. ease and so on, it will take some time. The other angle that has not been followed up on is county government. I was really shocked by the absence of go county government officers for the time that I was there, which is Friday, Saturday. Um, quarries are essentially managed. They are, you know, they are uh, dump sites, um, uh, waste um, uh, landfills are essentially the responsibility of the county government. And what you have in Quarry is essentially a huge landmass of rubbish um, and a huge, um, I guess what you'd call like a, a kind of a, 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 it's like a quarry, huh? um, yeah. but it's full of rubbish. And they say it's about 136 feet deep. Um, and essentially what we require is for that entire space to be treated like a crime scene and to be trawled for any additional bags. Um, 
and it's only today we will find out how many um, how many people how many human beings have lost their have been recovered from the place but we need to argue that you know all the quarries across the country um, need to be fenced off um, the county governments um, need to take responsibility for those spaces and that's what the locals are also saying is that why is it that the space can be left um, open for for others yeah now wambu the wambu man Oh my God! Oh yeah! All responsibility has been left to him. Mm. Yeah. Authorities, you you were there. Yeah. Uh, are, are police actually being involved or uh, in the rescue mission rather, or is it just Wambu who's been left to go into the waters and try retrieve as many bodies as yeah. he possibly can? So I had a sense of, um, I guess the uh, French would say déjà vu. Mm -hmm. I had a sense of <coughs> how sad it is that when you have these mass crimes how poor the uh, multi-agency coordination is. Um, we experienced this first in Yala. Um, so Wambua has a, a counterpart in Yala, a man who's a diver. Mm -hmm. uh, he was taught diving by his father. And he essentially is paid anywhere between 200 shillings to 1,000 bob to go and retrieve bodies from the river Yala. And of course, during the January 2022 um, revelations and the numbers of bodies that we saw there, he was the person on site. And we were asking him constantly to go back into these rivers to pull out um, bodies, um, remains of bodies and decomposed bodies without any any um, backup. I mean, the best that uh, Wambua had um, on Saturday was ropes and um, uh, gloves, um, nothing else. And uh, having said that, you know, the Red Cross uh, did show up at some point with a boat, uh, which allowed us to be able to um, look a bit more broadly across the, um, the water. Um, and of course, because these are, um, what do you call it? These are crime scenes. You've yeah. got the uh, Director of Criminal Investigations. And although they are under a lot of pressure, I think you also have to recognize what the toll is on these officers who have to go back, you know, day after day after day to basically go and check through rubbish, not knowing whether it is rubbish um, or human beings remains, you know. Um, but the multi-agency coordination um, has to improve. And one would have thought with the... Um, experience we had at the beginning of the year with the floods that we would have had a much uh, stronger, um, much more coordinated response to these cases rather than um, a few institutions essentially having to respond without the proper equipment. We haven't had like even family members coming to uh, indicate maybe uh, those are their close uh, yeah, relatives, relatives or or stuff like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. It's like no one seems to know who those individuals mm -hmm. are. And then police have not been uh, brought to book. Yeah. And uh, yet we saw there's video evidence and photo evidence of some police who are actually doing what they're not supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, on, no on action has been taken against them. Yeah, law on the protest policing, there is enough evidence, I think, that's in the public domain that if the director of criminal investigations was um, efficient and focused, they would be able to have had some of those officers, if not prosecuted by now, at least interdicted. Mm. And set aside. I mean, you know, the uh, photographic evidence that uh, Kenyans have put into the public uh, spaces um, is sufficient for an investigation for many of those officers. And um, I think that would be another indication to the Generation Z movement that, um, you know, that the state has heard them and that they are um, now concerned about what happened over the last three weeks. Speaking of Gen Zs, and you've seen them on the ground, and um, you know a lot of in, people are asking, also in our homes, I think. Huh? <laughs> exactly, they're in our homes every day. <laughs> you know, they say "Hawata uh, Banduka." Yeah. As always, the protests can go in different directions. If there is, um, you know, facilitation, outreach and um, conversations take place today mm. between some of the protest organizers and the intelligence services and the criminal investigation services know um, where potentially these uh, demos will take place. Their role is to essentially facilitate them, make sure they remain peaceful. Um, most times protesters just want to be heard. Um, in fact, they often say that, you know, uh, riots are the expression of the unheard, you know. So if somebody feels that they've been heard, mm -hmm. if they're able to, do, do, uh, pr uh, what do you call it, to present uh, petitions and to picket, they, you know, they'll do a couple of hours and they'll go home. Um, the question is really, you know, how do you manage that against the potential for violence and the introduction of goons and hooligans? And that's what we started to see towards the, the end of the uh, previous week, which was um, deliberate paying of uh, paid protesters that are not even protesters, they're just criminals. And, and do you see them um, 
being sustainable? Do you see the, the, the events being sustainable? Because obviously there's a lot of discouragement, discouragement, mm. if you will, you know, people mm. being abducted, people being shot, people being killed. Is it sustainable the I mean, way I, you see it? I think, I think the, the violence and the lawlessness is what has maintained the level of anger. Right. I mean, what I remember from that first and second protest is that there was not anger there. There was a sense of, you know, confidence. There was a sense of um, change that people wanted in the governance system. Um, what you started to see among the protesters was, you know, after Rex Masai was shot, for example, was a real sense of anger and disbelief. And I think that's what you have to manage. You have to manage a sense of fairness that you will be allowed to express yourself. You'll be allowed to. Um, you know, to march um, rather than if you march or if you uh, express yourself, we will pick you up in the middle of the night um, and um, we will disappear you for a few days. Mm. I mean, I think what happened to Billy uh, Siman, uh, Crazy Nairobian, as he's called, yeah. um, you know, was a galvanizing, f you know, was <clears throat> galvanizing for the protesters rather than essentially um, something that should not have happened in the first place. Um, so it's difficult to tell. You know, the thing about uh, Gen Z and people in their 20s, they have a lot more energy than those of us in our 50s. Yeah. You know, what, what struck me, which I think has not happened historically, mm. is um, youth from the informal settlements um, of the cities mm -hmm. um, joining and marching together with the children in the middle class neighborhoods. <clears throat> I mean, that I think was the turning point. And I think that's, a, that's the moment where, you know, the state got it wrong. You know, they didn't see the power that was in that movement. Mm. Um, and um, one would hope that uh, the choices of the cabinet secretary um, would really think about how do you present a state um, and the face of a state to young people from different classes. Speaking of which, the sacking of the CSs. Mm. Your thoughts? We do argue that you know the state has to be um, formed in the, I guess, in the image of the constitution. Like you know, it needs to be a listening state. It needs to be a responsive state. It needs to be a state that is um, that has state offices that are bound by um, Chapter Six, the leadership integrity. All of those things um, have to go into the selection of your cabinet. And um, obviously, the cabinet had lost the uh, confidence of the nation, <coughs> and therefore um, would have to go. And you see, it's a tough decision for President Ruto even when he comes to replacing his cabinet because the Gen Zs already have their demands mm -hmm. and criteria. And they're saying the kind of individuals who are to be appointed must meet that particular uh, kind of threshold. Do you think uh, he's going to be able to crack that? I think he has to. I mean, if he does not, he will just postpone, postpone this crisis longer for his government. And of course, as we loom towards the uh, electoral moment, um, it becomes much more dangerous uh, from an electoral point of view for him. Um, so therefore, you know, he has a chance to uh, essentially pick people who are not people who have um, skeletons, who have had cases in the past of economic crimes. He has to pick people who are clean, people who are coming to do you know, the work that they've been assigned. And essentially, I think what we're looking for is a merit-based process. Um, uh, so I think you know, he has the opportunity to get this right. Again, is Irungu Houghton's name on that list? Well, kuna kazi mingi ambayo amesema kuna job already. Kuna incentives lakini. You desire. Speaking of which, I don't know if you heard Moses Kuri over the weekend. No, I miss. He was interviewed like asama. If I was to come back again, I'd come back as a Gen Z. A Z. And he said he's very proud of himself. Yes. Yeah, because of the policies that he brought on board. Yes, like public service. <laughs> but he's actually recognized. Mm. He said that mm. they underestimated them, but mm. they've actually proven that they know what they want and they are tired of the rot in, uh, in our nation. I think we all underestimated them. I, I think so. I mean, we, as Amnesty, we do a lot of human rights education within universities, schools, and um, even in the communities. And um, one of the things that's shown us is that, um, you know, civic education, first of all, is really important. Mm. But it's not the absence of information. I think what we have had up until recently um, is not that people don't know what's going wrong. It is that they've not had the courage to stand up and say, we want our country back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because uh, Jeff mm. ever since, and even Baba Kinagalonzo, what are Mekuapo pushing for the same agenda? But it has never been as impactful as, as we, we saw recently. And yet, these are just 
uh, students, these are young people with nothing, like a weapon, nothing like violence. Just pushing for an agenda, which is we want our country back and we want people to actually be held accountable. Mm. Absolutely. Will Amnesty International ensure mm. or at least monitor that these kids, they are our kids, get their IDs because that's the most important thing right now. If they cannot get their IDs, they cannot vote. Yeah. I mean, I think the, um, you know, I, I was, uh, so I went for the concert, um, the protest concert. The Sunday took one. Place, the we, Sunday one. We saw you. Okay. Very good. Yeah, I probably was jumping a little bit too high. I mean, <laughs> you know, when, when you have like Giuliani, Eric, yeah, yeah. and, uh, you know, Octopizo and a whole bunch of people on the stage, yeah, yeah. it's difficult to observe with, with, with Kanda and, uh, <laughs> and Grace. You know? So I, I did jump up and down a little bit. Yeah. What struck me there was, you know, how we could have had, for example, an IEBC um, desk there registering people, mm, right, for those mm. that have their IDs. Um, we know that, you know, something like six million young people just didn't uh, vote in the last election, either yeah. because they didn't have the voters' card or they didn't have IDs or they didn't bother to get up because there was nothing that they saw in an electoral moment that really inspired them. So I think what we have to do is channel that en energy um, towards, you know, other spaces where people can use the, use the mechanisms that uh, our democracy has allowed us to have, you know, the right to vote, the right to speak, the right. So use those mechanisms in different ways so that it's not just on the streets that you find full expression. Um, so I would say to all the Gen Z who are listening to me right now is that, you know, please go out, um, you know, apply for the IDs. If necessary, go to um, uh, Nyao House and demand that you be given, um, you know, or the Huduma centers all over the country. I think now uh, that's an old school way of thinking. You know, go online, go to the e-citizen, go to a Huduma center and actually apply for an ID. And if you don't get it, make some noise, mm -hmm. you know, because you will need that in order to get your voter's card. And you, without a voter's card, you have you are not a player in that big moment that's coming in 2022 and Absolutely. of course what we've learned 2027 yeah. 2027 what we've learned is it's not just the five minutes in a polling station mm -hmm. it is the five years in between yeah. where you have to continue to be vigilant you have to continue to hold your government accountable and demand that it uses taxes in a way that you want them to use it not as somebody said you know if we, if we all wanted uh, you know the government to use taxes to buy ice cream for everybody all our children um, that's our wish. I mean, this is the, the, the thing about Article 1 is that uh, it actually gives the uh, responsibility to citizens to decide what governments should focus on. And if, you know, if you have a, a population that thinks, you know, that they should go in a particular direction, that is the wisdom of that population. It is important this time that we do the civic education so that people can understand. Yes, we, we stopped one uh, taxation bill, but in September, the budget cycle starts again. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Who is preparing Gen Z to make the kind of representation so we do not have the same crisis in June next year? Absolutely. Is there a fear that uh, the Gen Z revolution might be hijacked? I think always. I mean, all, all um, movements, uh, revolutions have within them the seeds for hijacking. And there are always external interests that try to channel them in, in the direction. I think we saw that with the introduction of, um, you know, hooligans and goons. And um, I'm told that they're still investigating poli uh, politicians for mm -hmm. who... Uh, bust these people into town and and gave them. There's also questions around, you know, where some of those goons allowed to roam freely along, uh, freely throughout the city in order just to create the conditions to criminalize peaceful protest. Um, so I think you know they they have to be careful. But I would also ask them. Um, to be, um, I guess, to be generous, compassionate, and also listening of each other. Because I think the toxicity that we've seen in government and disrespect for alternative views can also show up in a movement in which you are now beginning to cancel people. Um, I mean, the cancellation culture has also produced the energy in this moment um, to have a whole cabinet canceled. Um, but we need to make sure that actually people can also be heard. You've been in this business for a while, Irungu. Uh, have you see, ever seen anything like we're seeing today unfolding? Uh, it's, it's remarkable. I mean, I think, you know, I think all of us, uh, whatever generation we are, we will look back at this moment and probably we will name it in the way that I think we should name it, which is the third liberation. So the first liberation was independence. The second liberation was multipartism. This is the third gen the third liberation. And what this is about is is restoring a sense of transparency, a sense of accountability and governance um, that is people-centered, that is responsive to pe public op opinion rather than the interests of a few people who sit around a table in State House and make decisions on behalf of everybody.